welcome everyone. So I'm really happy to resume uh, the Shannon uh, channel talk uh, this year after a summer break. I hope everyone had a, an okay summer and stayed healthy and kept away from trouble. <laughs> Uh, I'm really happy to start uh, this year and have uh, our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Hamid Hassani from the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm really looking forward to listening to Hamid's talk on two facets of learning robust models. All right. Great. So shall I start? Yes, please. And you see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, we do. Let me... Okay, just a minute. I minimize the videos. All right. Okay, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending this virtual talk and also a uh, special thanks to Salim for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk on this fantastic channel. So the talk will be about learning robust models and perhaps a good starting point uh, for the talk will be um, to talk about specific applications where learning robust models would be very important for. And these are safety critical applications. And here by safety critical, I mean any application where the detections, decisions, or recommendations made by learning-based uh, systems would uh, impact the well-being of humans. A canonical example would be self-driving cars, where the detection of, let's say, pedestrians in a sidewalk would dramatically impact the safety of those pedestrians. Another example is in robotics, where the interaction between robots and humans is subject to obvious safety constraints. And also in, for example, medical imaging, the uh, learning-based models are used to uh, uh, do detections and uh, basically recommendations for treatments for the patients. And this is also obviously subject to safety critical constraints. So the main message here is that uh, machine learning-based models when deployed in safety critical applications must be robust and trustworthy. And um, this is somehow the like high level motivation for this talk and maybe it's best to continue and explain what this word robust means and how do we mathematically try to understand it. So talking about robustness, perhaps a natural starting point would be to talk about adversarial examples or adversarial learning. So the observation of the existence of adversarial examples um, goes back to a few years ago, around 2013. However, there is now a, a field in machine learning that has grown out of this observation. Let me explain to you what this observation and what this phenomenon of adversarial examples is. So let's assume that you uh, train a, a standard model or classifier. Okay, so think of it as a neural network based classifier. You train it using a standard data set, for example, SciFAR or ImageNet or let's say MNIST, whatever. And uh, when using this model uh, at test time on newly unseen images, if the image comes from, let's say, it's the same data type that you used for training the model, we know that, uh, that the model would, with high probability, classify the image correctly with high confidence. That's just a success of modern learning-based algorithms, such as deep learning methods. All right, so, so far, so good. This is just uh, the success of deep learning. However, so the, the, the observation uh, of robustness is the following. So if you take the same image and add to it a, a very small amount of noise and reach a noisy version of this image where the noisy version or the perturbed version is really for us as humans is indistinguishable uh, uh, with respect to the original image. However, um, adding a small well-crafted amount of noise to the image typically would cause misclassification. So here, the image of a panda would be misclassified incorrectly. For example, it would be classified as a gibbon, right? Let me, let me dig into this uh, phenomenon a bit more uh, in terms of mathematical formulations. So here, typically in machine learning, we treat, data, we treat uh, our data points or images, for example, as points in some Euclidean space, for example, RD, where D could be as large as the number of pixels inside the image. And um, so around every data point, we would draw a ball of radius epsilon. We should think of epsilon as a small number. And within this ball, we would search for points or perturbations of the original image 
such that um, the perturbed image would be classified incorrectly by our neural nets or by our whatever classifier or a learning model that we are using. So of course here, the choice of the nodes should be well-crafted with respect to the data point and, uh, and the classifier, and it's an adversarial choice. However, the point here, the main message here is that adding small amount of noise can cause huge misclassifications for modern learning-based models. So deep learning models, for example, are um, significantly fragile with respect to these small norm-bounded perturbations. And this, this phenomenon is now well-documented with uh, respect to this um, uh, in, 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 in the field of machine learning. As I said, there is a field grown out of it. And there are now thousands of papers on understanding these adversarial examples, providing algorithmic approaches to make uh, deep learning methods or in general learning methods uh, robust against these type of uh, 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 like uh, examples. I mean, the quick question. So uh, right. the noise, it looked like it's random. So any random noise with, with high probability will give you a, an, or it has to be well crafted, the noise to. That's a very good question. So typically adding random noise doesn't uh, lead to misclassification. You need to do something else. You need to somehow uh, make it adversary, choose it adversarially. And there are very simple, very very simple algorithms, uh, attack algorithms, basically. Which I mean, for example, you can just go along the direction of the sine of the gradient of the loss function, and this would give you an adversarial example. Okay, so it should be adversarial. All right. Uh, so um, now, so knowing the fact that these small norm bounded perturbations would uh, cause uh, huge misclassifications. A natural question that comes up is that what other transformations could cause misclassification? And it turns out that there is quite a few of those transformations that we'll uh, talk about just now. Um, so in addition to norm bounded perturbation that we just talked about, there are spatial transformations. So for example, rotations or rescaling. So if you choose, if you rotate your image in a, uh, in with, a, with an adversarial angle, this would most probably be misclassified by your classifier, okay? And rescaling is another example. Out of distribution data where you train your data in one domain and use it, uh, and then you test it on some other domain, adversarial patches are another example of transformations. Sensing mechanisms, so if, if you, the quality of the data acquisition device also matters, right? So if you capture your images with some camera, let's say, and use some other camera at test time, that would cause misclassification according to this study that was done a few years back. And uh, finally, there is a very broad class of transformations, which we call natural variation. Um, and these are transformations that are caused due to working in natural or uh, dynamic environments. And since the second part of the talk will be about these natural variations, I'd like to say a few more words about natural variation. So um, the, the central question that I want to answer now is how does data vary in natural environments? So in order to illustrate this, um, let me um, consider a simple data set, which is a set of images taken at taken uh, from different street signs in let's say in a certain city I think this is for Atlanta and um, all the images are taken in a in a sunny day in sunny weather basically and the goal here would be to classify the sign which is inside the image okay so this is a standard classification task you you would train a neural net using your training data and and typically on the same data it would work well now so let's say you train this neural net, and now you want to deploy it in real world, okay, later on. So you want to use it at test time. Of course, so for example, think about using this neural net as a predictor or classifier on your self-driving car, okay? So you are driving and you're using this neural net, basically. So the camera captures images and then it, the, the, sign, the, the sign inside the image this, uh, would be classified. However, in natural environments, you don't exactly see an image typically in a sunny day, okay? Oftentimes there is some level of natural variation added to it. For example, so a, one example of natural variation could be a snow, okay? So this is, the picture on the right would be, is exactly the same scene, same street sign, but taken in a snowy 
day. Okay, so these two pictures, the one on the right and the one on the left, they somehow correspond to each other. They are the same in terms of semantics, same street view, same street sign. However, they differ in the level or in, the, in terms of the natural variation. Another source of natural variation could be, for example, the rain, or uh, there are many others like dirty camera lenses, darkness, fogginess, blurriness, gray scale, exposure, and so on. Okay, so these are all different sorts of transformations, which we call, uh, uh, as a general class, which we call uh, uh, the class of natural variations. So given this, uh, the next natural question is whether or not our modern learning based models are robust against these type of natural variations. In order to answer this question, let me show you uh, a, a result of a simple experiment that we did. And um, so I'd, I'd use the same data set that I talked about in the previous slide. So street signs taken at um, uh, like sunny uh, weather. And let's try to test the neural net that's trained using this data set on different environments with different levels of natural variation. So if you, if you use the same neural net on uh, data that come from the same domain, meaning that on street signs that are uh, captured in sunny days, of course, uh, you would expect to get a very good performance. And as you see here, the curve at the top, the orange curve would show the performance on sunny, on, on images captured at sunny days. Okay, so performance is good. That's just the success of deep learning. However, if you add a small level of natural variation to it, for example, if you add a bit of snow to the images, okay, so you just capture the images at some snowy day, the performance drops for, by a few percent. If you add a little bit of more snow, the performance drops a bit more. And if you take your images or try to classify images taken at, let's say, a, 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 a snowstorm, then the performance would drop hugely by, let's say, around 60, uh, 30%. So this somehow shows that uh, these very general, and I show the snow here, you can do it with rain, fogginess, and so on. So this uh, class of transformations, natural variation, also cause huge misclassifications for neural, uh, for deep learning models or for learning based models. So this is another source of fragility of modern uh, learning based models. And arguably for safety critical applications, these types of natural variation are more important than adversarial examples. So these, these happen more often or these are basically more relevant to safety critical applications. So basically the point here is that and the same amount of effort that's been put on studying adversarial examples should also be put to this very important class of natural variation. All right, so in this talk, um, I'll focus on uh, uh, both of these challenges, uh, adversarial examples, non-bounded perturbations, as well as um, natural variation. And the first part of the talk will be about non-bounded perturbations. Uh, so for non-bounded perturbations, we have a, a precise understanding of the mathematical model behind how these adversarial examples are created. So there is a ball you choose for the worst, worst case point within the ball. So since we understand the problem mathematically, we, we have been able to uh, design algorithms, robust training algorithms to make our learning models robust against these type of examples. However, it's really fair to say that our understanding here is really at, uh, is, is, is at its beginning or infancy. And there is a, a variety of interesting and surprising phenomena which we observe and we don't know really how to uh, justify. And also our robust training algorithms at, at this moment are not really satisfactory in terms of what we can expect. So first part of the talk will be about uh, understanding uh, the mathematics or the trade-offs, fundamental limits of uh, adversarial examples in a conventional problem in machine learning, which is regression. Second part of the talk will be about natural variation. So in the case of natural variation, we don't really have a good model. We don't even understand this natural variation mathematically. There is no analytical model that would give us like uh, natural variation. And so, so this is one challenge. The other challenge is that since we don't really mathematically understand this, we don't really know at the moment how to train robust models uh, for these type of challenges. So second part of the talk will, uh, will be about a framework to answer the above challenges, which we call model-based robust learning. So basically we'll try to answer these questions for natural variation. So first part will be have will will have analytical curve theorems and so on. Second part will be most like uh, fancy plots and images and so on. All right. 
So let me now start with the first part of the talk, which is on adversarial examples in the problem of linear regression. This is joint work with uh, Ada Javan Mard and Mahdi Sultan al Kotabi from uh, USC. And the paper uh, was presented at uh, the, very recently at the conference on, on learning theory last June. All right, so let me now continue uh, with uh, this mathematical framework that we, we, were start, we started to develop for adversarial examples. In order to do so, let me take it one step back and start from very basics, from supervised learning, okay? So for the moment, let's go 50 years back, no adversarial examples, nothing here, just the standard vanilla supervised learning model. So in, in supervised learning, uh, again, it's 50 years back, uh, data uh, is assumed to come from a distribution that's oftentimes unknown. And the problem would be to find a model. So here, the model would typically is represented by theta. You can think of theta as the parameters of the neural net or as the parameters of your linear classifier or, or regressor and so on. So we wanna find the best model that has the smallest loss, here L would stand for the loss, that has the smallest loss with respect to uh, the distribution that generates the data in expectation, okay? So in, in other words, we wanna minimize the expected uh, error, okay? We are using, we are, we are trying to find that model. Now, of course, however, we don't know the distribution of the data, and typically what we have access is a data set, so n data points, and um, the, what we do typically is to solve the empirical risk minimization problem, which is just uh, is replacing the expectation with uh, a sum, an empirical sum over all the data points that we have, the training data points. And theta hat would be the model that we learn. And so like there has been like 50 years of development into this. So now we have very good uh, models, learning based models that work well on data that comes from the actual distribution. For example, deep neural networks, they work very well on, on, uh, on, on data. However, as I mentioned before, um, these models oftentimes fail badly on adversarial examples, okay, on a small norm bounded perturbations of, of data. And let's now uh, proceed with um, driving the problem formulation for adversarial examples. So, in adversarial learning, data is the same. Distribution of data would be the same. However, um, at test time, uh, there are adversarial examples. So what does adversarial example mean? Uh, so let's look at the inner maximization problem. So for every data point that we see, we go uh, over a ball around that data point of radius epsilon. Okay, so that's just under the max, the norm of delta being less than epsilon. And we search uh, over this ball for the worst case perturbation that maximizes the loss, okay? So this is just the inner maximization problem. We search over the ball for a point that maximizes the loss, okay? And this ball, you should think of it as a very small ball around every data point. And we are, so in, in the adversarial learning setting, we are looking for um, a parameter vector that minimizes um, the expected uh, risk with respect to the worst case exam. So it's a minimax problem. Okay, so we wanna solve this problem, obviously, for adversarial learning. However, again, we don't have access to the whole distribution. We only have access to data and data points, let's say, through our data set. So one way to solve uh, this problem would be to relax it to the empirical version, which is called the robust ERM problem. It's just it's just change, um, replacing the expectation with the empirical sum. And this is what, um, and there are other ways to solve this, um, yeah, to relax this, but this is the most dominant approach right now. Just look at the robust ERM version and try to solve the, the ERM problem, the min-max min problem that you see at the bottom of the page. Um, just a quick, quick question. Yes, please. Is this similar to the data augmentation technique? So that's a very good point. Um, so all of, okay, let, let, me, let me give you a general claim. All of uh, adversarial training methods are different forms of data augmentation, okay? What, what's important is how you choose the data that you wanna augment. So if you look at the inner maximization problem here, every time you would choose a data point that somehow uh, is inside the body's a perturbation and you add it to your data set. So it's somehow a data augmentation problem. But, but 
so so in general, everything is data augmentation. We are just being doing a smart data augmentation uh, to, to some sense. However, um, so in, in the adversarial learning community, um, these type of algorithms, these are called PGD type algorithms. They are they are basically separated from data augmentation algorithms. Okay. okay. Very good. I also have a quick question. Yes, Salim, please. From, from a practical point of view, what does it mean that I restrict the, adver the adversary to only make a perturbation within a, a Euclidean ball? Ah, okay, excellent. So uh, from the practical point of view, so the, I think you are asking about like, what are the applications of this, right? Yeah. So, um, so as I said, adversarial examples are important mathematically. So they have helped us a lot to understand different aspects of robustness. However, their applications are uh, mainly in security type applications. So let's say that there is um, there is an adversary who could add noise to your uh, to the image that you capture, right? So these are mainly security type applications. If you want to think about. But what if, for example, uh, I mean, I can imagine he could. Uh, uh, I'm questioning the the Euclid. I, I know for for theory, it's fine. Like right. for example, I mean, he's allowed to change the panda as long as it looks same to the human eye, for example. So right. That's within a Euclidean ball or not. So right. Have yes. people a different kind of uh, budgets? Type right. of there are, yeah, there are. I mean, as I said, there are thousands of it. There are different types of balls. So different types of norms. L LP ball, L infinity balls. There is Wasserstein balls where they somehow try to... Um, so like, um, you, you know, they consider the Wasserstein distance to change the image. There are different types of balls. Okay, so here... The norm, you, you can think of the norm to be like a general type of concept here. But again, the, the main application of all of these would be through, uh, let's say security applications for now. Okay. But they have helped us a lot in understanding uh, uh, like different, the landscape of robustness as well as, they have, um, as, well as um, like designing robust algorithms. All right. So, so may, I, may I also ask a question to Stone? Yes, Stone, um, please. Um, Aren't you just, she's just changing the loss function to say, a, a lo take one loss function L, now mm -hmm. you essentially make a new loss function by essentially looking over a Euclidean ball and then take the, the max. So you have another loss function now. Right, right, right. So it's- But it's, the same reason that the original loss function was susceptible to adversarial attacks is now you have a different loss function. I could apply the same adversarial attack with just with a different loss function. And it seems like, there's something a situation of turtles all the way down because you can keep on modifying your loss function over and over again because you could use the same procedure which say your loss function that I've created right now and do it again and again and again but the basic uh, uh, argument right. why adversarial attacks work still work but you just make the loss function just slightly more say smooth or uh, has less high frequency components but, but nothing really changes fundamentally Right. Um, so in terms of the, the learning part, um, well, I agree. So there is a completely different loss function, but slightly different loss function that we want to optimize. The important point is that is the is the discontinuity here. Uh, that so while we are changing the loss function slightly, uh, the model is very fragile to this change of loss functions. So it's it's about robustness. I agree. Like. Uh, doing the robust ERM version, solving it is just doing an ERM on this generalized um, loss function. That I agree with. The important point is, is robustness, I think. But, but isn't that, and again, I don't want to, 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 to delay this talk too much, but isn't then the, the core issue that we have here is that if the loss function is fragile, meaning there's discontinuities or high frequency components in the loss function, that is the essential cause for, say, adversarial attacks. So what I you try to do is come up with a loss function that is more robust, and therefore you give less opportunity to an adversary to exploit right. that. That's a good point. I think fragility, uh, fragility comes from the, uh, the, the hypothesis class, the neural net, not from the loss function. So for example, consider the human eye, the human vision system. For us, I mean, you, you just add a small noise. I mean, whatever you add, we can, we can basically, dis, uh, we can classify it correctly. So it's more, the problem is more on, let's say the, le the current learning based models that we have, I think, right? So there is al always the example of the human vision system, which is somehow working ideally in these situations. 
But again, the human vision system is has a say smoothness built in the way that the, the human yeah, vision I, system I, is extremely smooth mm -hmm. by design. Actually, there are works now that I mean, you you mentioned a very very good point and very deep point. So there are now so people has started to wonder if if for example if we put high frequency fil filters filters that basically delete the uh, filter the high frequency components of the image then this would somehow smoothen things out and this would help with respect to adversary examples however we see little very little uh, improvement by by using those filters so as i said this this field we don't really understand much right now but but what you are saying is really deep I think, Hamid, that this is a very interesting point. I don't know the field, but it, it, I think it's, it'd be nice to understand is that exactly is phenomena because we're formulating the problem in, a, in, a, in an ill-formulated way or it's fundamental? Is it the problem? Yeah, but I, I guess you, you answered this, but I, I like this question. Yeah, exactly. That, that was a very great, great and very deep question. I agree. So maybe one one final remark, and then uh, so sure, actually this this has been so work in the same direction a long time ago. While digital watermarking was still a thing, mm -hmm. there were uh, attacks on digital watermarking system essentially exploiting the same problem, which is by small moisture perturbations, and then sending those perturbations in the right direction, which is to the boundary of a digital watermarking uh, decision a region. You could essentially do the same type of, uh, say, uh, destroy digital watermarks. This right. seems very similar to me. I see. I see. I think that the connection hasn't been explored in the in the in, in this field of adversarial learning, but this is definitely worth exploring. Very good. Thank you. Um, all right. Okay. So um, so um, I mentioned the the main objective that we want to solve. This is the min-max problem involving the expectation. However, when we have uh, access to a data set, we have to basically do the empirical version and that's the robust ERM version that typically people try to solve. Now, um, so let me, let me uh, summarize things a bit. So for supervised learning, we know that the model that we learn as a result of ERM would work on test data. However, it fails badly on adversarial examples. Then we can do the robust ERM version. So train models by solving the robust ERM problem. And that's called adversarial learning. And the model that we learned using by solving the robust ERM problem, that definitely would work better in terms of adversarial examples. It improves robustness. However, it's, it's been repeatedly observed that the performance of the robust trained model degrades on the original benign data points. Okay, so if you use the same model that you basically trained uh, to make it robust, if you use it on the original data points, points that are non perturbed then you see a, a huge degrade, degradation in terms of the performance. In other words, so if I want to plot uh, the behavior of different models uh, in, this, uh, in this plane that has on the y axis the adversarial error and on the x axis the standard error, then Theta hat was just a result of uh, the standard supervised learning training. So this is just the solution of ERM. So theta hat, the performance is here. So it's um, standard error is low. However, its adversarial error is high. Now, if you use theta hat of epsilon, and remember, so whenever I put epsilon, this means that there's some adversarial involved. Now, theta hat of epsilon is the solution of robust ERM. And typically we observe that, yes, the adversarial error goes down, however, the standard error goes up. So in other words, it seems that there is a trade-off between these two kind of objectives, the uh, standard error as well as the adversarial errors. And in order to buy robustness, in order to obtain robustness, we need to somehow pay in terms of the standard accuracy. So to understand the pros and cons of these type of adversarial training methods, there are some key fundamental questions that need to be asked. First of all, are, so what are the fundamental trade-offs between robust and standard accuracies? Is this, uh, is this type of uh, uh, trade-off that I just mentioned? Is it because we don't have good algorithms or there is something more? If you have infinite data, infinite computational power, can we basically obtain models that are both good in terms of adversarial error and standard error? So that's one fundamental question that we need to answer. The other question is, once we have obtained these uh, fundamental trade-offs, can we algorithmically achieve those trade-offs? 
And finally, what what what's the role of other things, other type of uh, other uh, properties or of the model that comes in? For example, what's the role of the size or number of parameters of the model, or the quality or size of the data or the number of training data points? So these are the key questions that we need to answer. And now, what I try to do is to uh, is to consider the problem of linear regression, Gaussian linear regression, and try to answer these questions within the problem of linear regression. Okay, so uh, Gaussian linear regression. Let me quickly mention what the uh, problem is. So data, um, so it's labeled x i y i. X i comes from the uh, I'm, I'm simplifying everything here. X, X i comes from the Gaussian distribution, IID components, independent components, and the covariance matrix is the unit uh, matrix. Uh, so the label is the inner product of X i with um, a, a true model, theta zero, plus some noise w i. And this noise is also Gaussian and independent operator. So this is just a very simple standard Gaussian linear regression setting. And we assume that we have n data points of this type generated IID. Now, the goal of linear regression is, of course, to estimate this uh, parameter theta zero, the ground truth theta zero. And uh, so for the adversarial version, again, I'm simplifying the problem. We could just consider the L2 ball here. Okay, And L2 ball is that around every point, you would consider the Euclidean ball of radius epsilon. And here, I oftentimes use epsilon test. This means that epsilon test is the power of adversarial test. All right, so that's the basic setting. And okay, so let me just um, define a few uh, other notions which will be useful to understand fundamental limits for our problem. So given um, any parameter choice of the parameter theta, you can use this theta to predict the labels uh, through this inner product that you see here. And the loss function that we use is the simple quadratic loss function that measures the quality of uh, the choice of the parameter theta. Okay, so um, the inner product of x and theta would be what, what your prediction using the model theta and y would be the actual label. And the difference of the two to the power two would be the loss. Now, there are two fundamental quantities that I wanna study their <coughs> relation and trade-offs. First of all, standard risk, which is just the expectation, the quality of, um, so the expected risk or the expected error of the model theta under uh, the original distribution of data. And there is the adversarial list, which is the um, expected behavior of the model under these uh, L2, let's say, perturbations. Okay, so think, uh, consider, so keep those uh, fundamental, these kind of notions in mind because we want to understand and study the trade off between the two. Okay, so optimal trade offs. So, what, what I'm going to do now is to assume that I have infinite data, infinite computational power, and so what I'll do is to try to find the minimizer of both, both of these risks, the adversarial risk and the standard risk for different models. And, and I, I, would, I would study these for different models and see what kind of trade-offs do I get, okay? So, so in other words, what I'm doing is the following. I go over all the possible models theta, okay? Any theta in RP would be one model that I use. For every model, I would basically put the corresponding pair the, the standard risk and the adversary risk uh, computed from that model in this, in this two-dimensional plane. Okay, so that would give me a region of all the possible pairs that I can achieve uh, with, with using a specific model. Now, for regression, it turns out that this re region would be a convex region, okay? Now, in order to understand trade-offs, we need to understand, uh, we need to study the boundary of this region. So these are the so-called Pareto optimal points of this region. And these are points that, so every point at the boundary um, has, has this property that if you fixed one coordinate and try to decrease the other coordinate, you would fall out of the region. Okay, so in other words, these points at the boundary are somehow the optimal points that, uh, that give us the trade-off between the standard and the adversarial risk. Okay, so we cannot do really better than the points at the boundary. Okay, no matter what our model is. 